For the past few years, my works have mostly been concerned with the attainment of formal richness. On a surface level, these pieces present highly active sonic materials that spend short periods of time before they undergo multiple transformations. This is the result of employing multi-layered compositional processes that attempt to decouple instrumental means of sound production. I have found that this aesthetic tendency allows for the development of complex formal relationships on a deeper level of construction. A major consequence of my personal approach to instrumental decoupling is the intrusion of timbral noise, which is mostly due to paradoxical physical actions applied to a number of different instrumental techniques. Although this presentation does not primarily focus on this type of timbral noise, it delves into the role of a parallel noise in my notational practice, particularly the space between notational data and the execution of that data. I have termed this space the noise interstate. You can read about this connection, uh, you can read about the connection between this idea and a few concepts from information theory in a book chapter that I wrote for uh, the Noise in NS Music book published by the University of Huddersfield Press. But for purposes of this presentation, I would prefer to jump directly into my own work and particularly its notation. The noise interstate is a psychological state that exists within the performer's psyche during the interpretive process of my work. Its primary goal is to contribute to the elaboration of multiple potential sonic outcomes, whose particularities share certain essential characteristics in relation to the original musical score. While the identity of the resulting music stays intact, the noise interstate diversifies the potential interpretations of the work thus presenting a greater degree of sonic variation across a number of performances. Therefore, its influence during the interpretive process of the score can only be perceived after listening to multiple performances or versions of the same piece. What I propose is an approach to notation that allows the noise interstate to intervene. Deliberate equivocation, which is the technique that I'm talking about, attempts to reconsider the original notion of certain material and formal constructions in such a way that the process of interpreting the score triggers a procedure of reorganization that is partly unintended during the early stages of the work's formalization. Furthermore, deliberate equivocation inherently contributes to the understanding that composition and performance are categorically different activities. The former is principally concerned with both the creation and organization of notational signifiers, while the latter is intrinsically closer to interpretational operations in relation to the score. The type of reorganization that takes place during performance is not left completely to the performer's discretion, but instead assists in the redistribution of potential sonic relationships in such a way that the piece is dimensionalized, but its integrity remains intact. The performer is thus capable of creating degrees of variance, which may suggest unaccountable formal paths that transcend both the peculiarities and the original implications of the compositional process of the piece. This is, however, an issue that often needs to be reconciled. The level at which the noise interstate becomes an undesired influence can be problematic. Nonetheless, a competent use of deliberate equivocation on behalf of the performer might produce a set of two parallelogramming windows, a quantitative one, which sparks a field of intermediate states between slightly and highly unpredictable results, and a qualitative one, which provides the possibility of unforeseen formal trajectories. The noise interstate is thus a truly experimental mechanism, for it attempts to raise questions that would otherwise not have been formulated. I must now briefly explain the nature of my recent notation before delving into the specifics of deliberate equivocation. On a basic level, this notation is divided into three fundamental domains. One, projection surfaces, two, parameterized objects, and three, temporal organization. One needs to imagine that these are separate layers that are superimposed onto each other. They contribute to an array of multi-level paradoxes that will be further discussed. The projection surface functions as a delimiter of vertical space. 
In other words, it provides a specific area where other materials acquire a defined contextual situation. The parameterized objects consist of a number of signifiers that convey certain physical motions that the performer applies to her or his instrument. For instance, they indicate technicalities in relation to instrumental means of sound production, such as amount of bow pressure, position of the left hand on the fingerboard, and bow speed. Temporal organization provides an insight into the specific nature of the temporal speed and division that has been developed throughout the process of composition. Once these three domains are juxtaposed onto each other, one can see the final disposition of the score. In recent pieces, I have developed two compositional techniques that contribute to the process of deliberate equivocation. These are temporal displacement notation and perspective notation. Temporal displacement notation compresses and or expands the horizontal scale to which the parameterized objects and the projection surfaces belong. In other words, its main purpose is to reestablish the relationship between the numerical information on the timeline and its visual counterpart in multiple states. Temporal displacement notation allows the performer to redefine the nature of her or his own comprehension of the notated timelines, thus sonically producing slower or faster surface tempi in relation to the translational possibilities of the notated materials. The following is a piece for solo saxophone with optional parts for violin and or cello. One can see that the saxophone part is visually the largest on the score, and also that it directly maps onto the two upper timelines, A and B. In fact, these timelines correlate only to the saxophone part. What this means is that the outer performers, violin and cello in this case, do not translate the notational materials into sound based on their own interpretation of time, but must rather gravitate toward the saxophone player's sense of time. The saxophone part functions as the temporal center of the work, whereas the violin and cello parts operate as satellites. This potentially increases the amount of entropy within the channel between score and performer. The main attribute that deliberately contributes to equivocation is the dislocational praxis in the relationship between the timelines and the spatial situation of the outer parts. For instance, the cello part shown is meant to be performed during the timeline B of the saxophone part and should span the same duration, that is approximately 10 seconds. Though this is visually contradictory since the area occupied by the cello part and the score is substantially smaller than that of the saxophone part. Thus, the cellist is left with no visual references in that she or he cannot base her or his interpretational decisions on the part's vertical alignment with the saxophone part. Such a disassociation raises many interpretational questions that need to be solved during rehearsal. Another type of temporal displacement notation appears in KDBS for solo double bass. Note the development of the temporal organization of this example, as indicated by the green timeline. The areas of the double bass part that are left white contain the original spatiotemporal scale on which the parameterized objects are superimposed. The horizontal length occupied by the representation of one real second within the white areas is different than the length that one second will take within a green area, as you see in figure 7. Indeed, each particular shade of green indicates a specific speed at which the parameterized objects pass. One major consequence of this technique is closely related to a type of parameterized object in particular. The bottom area of the projection surface displays information related to the range of the instrument. Within that area, we can see several groups, each consisting of an array of vertical lines of different lengths. The bottom ends of these lines indicate the approximate placement of the finger onto the string indicated by the attached Roman numerals. That is, the lower the notated end is within the range, the lower the sound produced should be in relation to the finger's string. Although one could count the exact number of vertical lines per group, the truth is that each collection should simply be performed as an extremely fast accumulation of left-hand articulations. Since one second will have differently notated lengths according to its surroundings, the performer should keep in mind that the exact number and quality 
of the articulations produced after interpreting the groups of vertical lines fall into a realm that exists beyond the original text. The disconnection between the score and the performer is highly evident, thus contributing to the emergence of deliberate equivocation. In contrast, perspective notation explores the potentially unstable peculiarities available via the juxtaposition of the parameterized objects onto the projection surface. Perspective notation, however, does not directly transform the characteristics of the objects, but instead redefines the topology of the projection surface to a lesser or greater degree. Such a redefinition of the delimiting space provided by the score drastically affects the signification of the parameterized object to the extent that its own interpretational denotation reshapes the performer's views of the notation. Therefore, Perspective notation increases the entropy within the channel between score and performer, allowing a completely new level of textual ambiguity or interstateness to flourish and pushing the performer to recreate mentally a new subtext based on the original score that has the potential to trigger relatively unexpected sonic results, hence the multidimensional identity of the musical work. An example of the use of perspective notation can be found in figure 10. Figure 10 introduces a 19 second study for solo piano. The score is conventionally divided into right hand, left hand, and pedals. The projection surface for each hand is divided into two secondary domains. For example, the right hand area indicates the specific hand shapes that the performer needs to articulate. It also expresses precise information regarding the vertical positioning of the hand onto the keyboard. That is, the closer the notated hand is to the top line of the secondary domain, the closer the performer's hand should be in relation to the instrument's open fallboard. Additionally, the secondary domain below the hand shapes has two purposes. Its higher and lower boundaries function as delimiters of both horizontal spacing, i.e., register, whose information is conveyed by the purple lines, and intensity of attack. That is, as an example, resulting dynamics, whose information is conveyed by the orange lines. This space is divided into seven horizontal equidistant subfields that translate into the number of octaves of the conventional piano keyboard. Notice also the small subfield below, which translates into the minor third um, in the lower register of the piano. Version 1.0 does not incorporate perspective notation. Version 1.1, on the other hand of the study, introduces perspective no notation substantially. A reorganization of the spatial information between the octave delimiters within the projection surface strongly influences both the number and the quality of the translational possibilities of the parameterized objects. Even though the exact placement of such objects has not changed at all, the context to which they belong has experienced a dramatic transformation. Consequently, version 1.1 uses PN to modify the potential sonic outcomes of the score, especially in terms of horizontal spacing and intensity of attack. The remaining parameters do not un directly undergo this recontextualization. Figure 12, 12 sorry, clarifies the intricacies of the metamorphosis that the projection surface has gone through from version 1.0 to 1.1. In conclusion, I would say that while the noise interstate has the potential to enrich the oral perception of translational mechanisms, it can also cause problems. It is one element in a labyrinthine network in which many aspects, whose boundaries all seem somewhat ambiguous, textual and subtextual formalization, interpretation, perception, memory, and expectation, history, and semiotics, coexist and relate to each other. I have found that a substantial part of my compositional strategy must be concerned with what I believe is the appropriate balance of that network of ideas. The right balance is not necessarily one accomplished by making static decisions. Instead, it tends to change according to the nature of the materials at stake. The noise interstate offers a unique contribution to this array of interlocked aspects. It operates as cement that both unifies and complexifies interconnectivity 
that is intrinsically unfolded among such natural features of the musical experience, hence its interstatedness. This is its most beneficial and most risky peculiarity, for its tendency toward high unpredictability may lead to counterproductive results. For example, completely undesired situations due to both the high quantities and qualities of the circumstances involved. The fine line that separates desirable and unwanted sonic outcomes is at the center of this problematization, and it raises two fundamental questions. Firstly, does the delimitation of this fine line need to be treated from a compositional perspective, or does this issue belong to the performative interpretive domain? And secondly, what exactly is an undesired situation? The answer to this has to do, at least in part, with a thorough evaluation of the context raised by the notated materials and their potential sonic implication. My role is to develop a set of criteria that redefine the very nature of perceptual aesthetic judgments, thus providing a sort of tabula rasa in which novel psychological responses and expectations might be constructed. In consequence, the line separating unwantedness and desirability becomes a dimensionalized entity. Its purpose is no longer to fix simple dichotomical boundaries, but rather to emerge as the volume in which the potentialities of the noise interstate as aesthetic transgressor can be extensively explored. Instead of providing answers regarding the ability of a material to work within a particular context, the noise interstate questions the status quo between object and context. As for the former question, the aforementioned delimitation should be assumed neither to be a compositional issue nor a performative one. It belongs to a domain that lies in between historically acquired compositional and interpretational goals. Although I do not tend to perform in public, many of the decisions I make at my desk are closely connected to traditional interpretation and they also result in compositional manifestations. My own interpretational image of a previously notated signifier might lead to underlying decisions regarding the formal evolution of a score. In other words, an interpretive conclusion that will never be properly consumed might transmute into a notational expression. It is a no man's land between composition and performance. At its core, the noise interstate represents my attempt to formalize musical possibilities beyond text. It operates as a gate toward a comprehensive oversight of the prospective subtextuality cultivated by the notational idiosyncrasies of my score. Thank you.